Osio, Tohiju, tradition, uh, traditional greetings from my lands on the Cherokee Nation Reservation in Oklahoma of the United States. I'm Pam Kingfisher, a daughter of plutonium and the co-coordinator along with Dimity Hawkins from Australia of the Nuclear Truth Project. Welcome to our first in a series of webinars showcasing voices of lived experiences, expertise, science, and creativity in nuclear abolition work. Sorry, my screen is here. The Nuclear Truth Project is a new international initiative connecting indigenous peoples, affected communities, international and civil society organizations, experts, governments ad advocating for nuclear abolition. We're working to create support and political will to build momentum for our ultimate goal, the total elimination of nuclear weapons, together with redress for those who've been harmed and minimization of future harms from the widespread ecological damage and radioactive violence that has already occurred and continues today. I'm honored to introduce our three speakers in the order in which they'll present. Rosnet Timius from the Bikini Atoll and the Kili and Fidget Islands within the Marshall Islands. Rosnet is joining us from Hawaii, where she is currently an undergraduate at the University of Hawaii, majoring in political science with a minor in pre-law. Rosnet was very involved with Jodicum, a nonprofit organization focused on empowering Marshallese youth to rise up to the issues of climate change and nuclear legacy that are affecting their tiny islands, vast ocean, and humble people. Rosnet continues to raise an awareness about the Marshallese nuclear legacy, specifically oh, its progress. connection to health, education, and climate change in the Marshall Islands. And then we'll hear from Danity Lopin from the Marshall Islands, where she continues to voice her people's deep concern of the nuclear legacy that intersects with climate change, health, and youth. Currently based in Mahuro Atoll, Danity works as a curriculum specialist at the Ministry of Education Public School System. She's a former lead member of the Marshall Islands Student Association and co-founder of MISA for the Pacific. She led the first MISA for the Pacific Solidarity March in 2019 in Suva and co-directed the excellent film, My Fish is Your Fish, which will be linked here. Danity continues to speak to the ongoing health and environmental impact in the Marshall Islands resulting from the United States, 67 nuclear weapons tested in the Marshall Islands. And then we'll hear from Dr. Arjun Makajani, who is the president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research here in the US. Arjun has a PhD from UC Berkeley in engineering, specializing in nuclear fusion. A recognized authority on energy issues for over 40 years, Dr. Makajani has deep knowledge of nuclear issues, including the impacts of testing. Arjun is the author and co-author of many reports on books and books on energy and environment related issues, including as principal editor of Nuclear Wastelands, produced by MIT Press. He has served as a consultant on energy issues to utilities, including the Tennessee Valley Authority, the Edison Electric Institute, the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, and several agencies of the United States. No, hello, the United Nations, but most importantly to me, the Cherokee Nation. And he was the lead scientist for Native Americans for a Clean Environment when we shut down 23% of the world's uranium supply, I knew this would happen, together in 1993. Arjun's a co-founder of the Nuclear Truth Project. With that, I welcome Danity to begin. Pam, I think oh, Rosnet will begin. Rosnet, I'm sorry. Yeah. I spoke. Okay. Welcome, Rosnet. It's okay. Thank you. Yeah, well, everyone. I am Rosnet Tumius, healing from the Tola Pivini and Kale and Ejin Island. I want to give first give a big komolo, big komolo thanks to the organizers of this event. Um, thank you for allowing me space to speak and share the history of my people. I dedicate my speaking time to 
our nuclear victims and survivors. And before we begin, may I ask that we have a moment of silence for the lives that were lost due to nuclear testings. Thank you, everyone. Um, <clears throat> can you guys see my slides? Yes. Okay, thank you. In the Pacific Ocean lies the region of Oceania. This region comprises of the ethnogeographic of the ethnogeographic groups called Polynesia, Micronesia, and Melanesia. The Republic of the Marshall Islands, along with the Republic of Palau, Republic of Kiribati, Republic of Nauru, Federated States of Micronesia, Guam, and Northern Mariana Islands, all make up what is known as Micronesia. Today, our focus will be on the history and nuclear legacy of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. The Republic of the Marshall Islands is a cluster of 1,156 low-lying islands and islets and 27 coral atolls. The Marshall Islands is divided into two chains, and the western chain of the Marshall Islands is called Rari, meaning sunset, and the eastern chain is called Rada, meaning sunrise. The population of the Republic of the Marshall Islands is around 41,000 people, and majority of the population live on the capital city, which is Negro, that's all. Rosie, you're muted. I'm very sorry. I am very sorry. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay, so about the Marshall Islands, uh, the Marshall Islands is a cluster of 1,156 low-lying islands and islands and 27 coral atolls. The Marshall Islands is divided into two chains and the Western chain is of the Marshall Islands is called Raidik, meaning sunset, and the Eastern chain is called Radak, meaning sunrise. The population of the Republic of the Marshall Islands is around 41,000 people and the majority of the population live on the capital city, which is Mejero Atoll and an island in Guayarén, it's all called Ibai. The official language of the Marshallese people is Marshallese, and the second language being English. The blue background of the flag of the Marshall Islands signifies the blue vast Pacific Ocean. The orange stripe represents the radic chain and it also depicts bravery to navigate the blue ocean. The white stripe of the flag represents the Radak chain, and it displays the peaceful nature of the Marshallese people. The sun's four big rays uh, stand for the capital city and its three subdistricts. And if you look closely at the four bigger rays, they, it is shaped like a cross and it is referring to the Christian faith of the Marshallese people. The people of the Marshall Islands are considered some of the greatest navigators of the world. They traverse the Pacific Ocean from one atoll to another in their canoes and use their man-made stick charts pictured below as their compass. The Marshall Islands is also home to the finest weavers. The handicrafts, traditionally known as amiwanos, are made from coconut shoot and co coconut shoot membranes and coconut fronds, shells, and pandanus leaves. And to create woven traditional clothes, traditional masks, baskets, fans, jewelry, and so much more. These amiwanos are admired for their intricate patterns and detailed carvings and designs. Similar to our brothers and sisters across the Pacific, the Marshall Islands was colonized. The first sighting of Spanish colonizers happened in the 16th century. 
And following the Spaniards were the Germans who introduced copra trading, and then the Japanese who established infrastructures, and later on, the United States of America. On December in the year of 1945, post-war, President Harry S. Truman declared the need of Muted again. Can you guys hear me? Sorry. Yes. On December in the year of 1945, post war, President Harry S. Truman declared the need for the U.S. Army to test the effect of atomic bombs. And the code name for the American led effort to develop a functional atomic. Uh, weapon was called the Manhattan Project. In February of 1946, Commodore Ben Wyatt of the U.S. Army, he's pictured below, um, made his first visit to the Atoll of Bikini in the Marshall Islands. Bikini was chosen because it is isolated, because of its isolation, and because airplanes and ships really go in that direction. Commodore Ben Wyatt assembled the people on a Sunday afternoon to propose that they leave their homeland for a short period of time in order to conduct a conduct the nuclear testing, which would be quote unquote for the good of mankind and to end all wars. His visit would lead to the exodus of 167 Bikinians from their homeland and the commencement of the Manhattan Project. <clears throat> From the years of 1946 until 1958, a total of 67 bombs were dropped, were tested in the Marshall Islands, specifically on Bikini Atoll and Enoeta Atoll. In the early morning of March 1, 1954, at 6.45 a.m., Operation Castle commenced and the most powerful hydrogen bomb codenamed Bravo, was dropped on Bikini Atoll. Bravo was 15 megatons and traveled at 47,000 feet, 47, feet in just one minute and 132 feet in less than 10 minutes. To put into perspective, um, the Bravo bomb was 1,000 times stronger than Hiroshima, the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, and it is estimated as if the U.S. were to drop uh, 1.6 Hiroshima bombs every single day for 12 years. That's how powerful the Bravo bomb was. During the Castle Bravo test, the water temperature rose by 99,000 degrees, 99, degrees Fahrenheit. Fish and corals flinged into the air, and a mile-wide 20, 250-feet deep crater remains on the seafloor. Castle Bravo vaporized three islands in Bikini Atoll and contaminated most of the atolls in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, especially the neighboring atolls of Tronglat, Enuela, and Udal. On March 1, 1954, just three days after Castle Bravo was dropped, um, 82 people from Tronglat and I and I were evacuated to Kwajalein Atoll to be treated and documented. This special and secret project was called Project 4.1. Scientists arrived, arrived to collect samples, obtain measurements, and observe the biological responses that show the level of exposure on each person. In this project, Urine and blood tests were drawn and collected daily. And the, hu the human subjects, as they were labeled, human subjects, um, bathed, were required to bathe three times a day in the lagoon with soap to see how their bodies would react. Before and after bathing, measurements were taken daily. Um, they, the U.S. Army documented the population and control groups in 
ways that set a baseline for further studies on the long-term effects of radiation. These informations were provided to ongoing studies on absorption rates, elimination processes, and other questions of interest to the national security and military defense of the United States. According to the reports on Project 4.1, the Bravo test has exposed 239 Marshallese on Budurak, Rongolat, and Ainamina atolls to a significant level of radiation. It is also important to note that animals such as pigs and rats were also subjected to treatment. After the completion of the testing and the United States was satisfied, the US military sent a men to build a crater on Enoela and this crater is called the Runato. This crater houses radioactive waste from the testing that were conducted on Bikini at all and Enoela at all, along with radioactive waste that they brought over from you, uh, the testings that were conducted on US soil in Nevada. <clears throat> this crack crater called Runatom is now leaking into our ocean and destroying our environment. It greatly contributes to the rising sea level amid the climate crisis. Um, so life after 1954 for the United States of America, uh, they continue to compensate the, for the damages done through the Compact of Free Association. And popular movies and TV series were inspired by the nuclear testings in the Marshall Islands and the famous beach attire that is worn to the beach uh, was also inspired by the nuclear testings. So next time you watch SpongeBob SquarePants or sit at the beach wearing your bikini, remember Castle Bravo. Although the people of Romalat and Omaila and Mudarak were able to return home and people of bikini have made or found a new home, Generation after generation of Marshallese people continue to suffer from the traumatic events that took place and the health and environmental effects of the nuclear testing. While fighting for nuclear justice, we are also fighting the issues arising from climate change. Our people were forced to move from their homeland for the good of mankind. And now we have to move from our out of our homeland because of mankind. And as I previously mentioned, I am from Gale Pikini Eje, KB for short, and most of my people of Pikini were relocated to a single island called Gale, and others relocated to an island islet on Mejero called Eje. There are only a few remaining number of nuclear survivors and who are still with us today and my boo or grandmother is being one of them. Throughout my boo life, her name is Poetime, I am named after her. Throughout her life, my grandmother has experienced evacuating her homeland, undergone two surgeries for breast cancer due to being exposed to radiation. And now she's living on an island that is extremely vulnerable to high tides and heavy rain. An island that you that has no lagoon for fishing and no proper soil to grow crops and harvest food. Her story, along with the as well as the stories of other nuclear victims and survivors, are reminders for us to always remember Castle Bravo and to aim to abolish nuclear weapons. Again, again, thank you to uh, the organizers of this event for allowing me space to uh, speak and share the stories of my people. And thank you to everyone who joined the webinar. I hope that you all were able to learn something from me today. Thank you, and we move to Danity.
Thank you so much, Rosnet. Danity, are you ready to go? Yes. Um, waiting for my slides to come up. Okay. okay. <clears throat> All right. Como tada? Thank you uh, so much, Yahweh. Hello, everyone. My name is Danity Logan, and I bring greetings to you all from my home, Mijiro Atoll, also known as the capital of Marshall Islands. I'm very thankful to be here today, and especially grateful to be sharing the panel with uh, Rosenet and Dr. Arjun. Next slide, please. All right. To begin, I'd like to pay homage to two incredible souls. Ichiro Mark from Bikini Atoll, sitting on the center right-hand photo, and Billy Edelman from Rolla Atoll, sitting on the left side of the left-hand photo. Um, for those who may not know, Ichiro, is, Ichiro and Billy are both survivors of the U.S. nuclear testing here in the Marshall Islands. I had the privilege of working with with them when we filmed our nuclear campaign video called My Fish is Your Fish. And I echo Pam's um, encouragement to, for all to watch it, um, it's accessible here. Thank you for sending the link. I think when you watch it, you might have a closer look to the inside stories of our nuclear survivors. Um, Pede and Ichiro's stories of their internal and external struggles with the testing continue to enable the work that we do, as Rosnet mentioned, especially because we are the younger generation of Marshallese now that are experiencing the ongoing impacts of nuclear testing here in our home. Next slide, please. I want to take this time to thank both of them for their gift of sharing and voicing our nuclear legacy with us here in the Marshall Islands and across the world. Ichiro and Pele were only children when the Castle Bravo was detonated in Bikini on March 1st of 1954. Um, Ichiro told me that he experienced all kinds of trauma when the Castle Bravo was detonated. And to add to his horrific experience, um, he lived in exile from his home since the US told his people that they couldn't live off the island. Um, he also told me that he would never forgive the U.S. for the lasting damage that they had caused on them. In fact, most of our survivors still hold anger and resentment toward the U.S. government. Bede shares a similar experience with Ichiro. She lived her life with thyroid cancer and told me that she would take many medications each day to keep her health stabilized. And she also went underwent um, surgery treatments for her cancer, thyroid cancer. Bede was many of the children in Romala Atoll who played with the fallout from the Bravo shot, thinking that they, those were snowflakes. And she lost her parents and siblings early on because of the immediate impacts of the fallout. Um, unfortunately, I learned recently, like last week from Rosnet, that Ichiro, who happens to be Rosnet's also grandfather, that he passed away two years ago. And just two weeks ago, I was making arrangements to visit Billy, only to learn that she passed away in November of last year. And in both times, I wasn't on island. And it's kind of sad that I didn't you know, get to say my last goodbye and respect to them. And more so, it's very sad that we're losing more of our first generation of survivors who hold you know, the firsthand stories of the testings. Because um, without their stories, I feel Marshallese nuclear history and stories might fade away from us, you know, causing us to lose the history. And I can only imagine the younger generation coming up, not having the opportunity to experience what I got to experience with Billy and Jiro. Um, both, Pichiro and Bede wanted nothing more than to return to their home. Next slide, please. I want to now quickly give an overview of the status of our health today in the Marshall Islands. 
all of which I believe links to our nuclear legacy. Um, the cancer rate in the Marshall Island continues to be on the rise with adults. We are seeing more people, especially girls and women over the age of 20, being diagnosed with cancer illnesses, such as cervical cancer, breast cancer, including many others, and other unspecified cancers. In a, in a source I extracted from our cancer registry here that shows cancer data in the RMI over a span of 15 years, uh, from 2007 to 2022, cervical cancer is the top adult cancer. And for our Marshallese women, we often don't know that we have cancer unless we get diagnosed early. And oftentimes these diagnoses are found when reach the late, late stages of our cancer. Marshallese continue to echo that we are all poisoned or radioactively contaminated. And this is to say that they oppose, we oppose U.S.'s claim that only four atolls were impacted from the Bravo sh shot. Um, they claim that Anyweather, Rongolap, Udurug, and Bikini are, uh, were the only highly affected um, atolls during the Bravo detonation. Um, it doesn't help that the nuclear waste storage in Runet Island that is currently leaking radioactive contamination to our ecosystem um, is ruining our crops and mixing with our fresh water lenses, exposing us to more radiation. I wanna make the case of um, non-communicable diseases because here in the Marshall Islands, it has worsened over the years. Um, young adults are diagnosed with NCDs today, even children. Why? Well, as many of our Marshallese, especially our elders, and often they will respond by saying, because of the, what the US did to our islands. And what they really mean is that Marshallese have lost their, our subsistence lifestyle as a result of the US nuclear testing. Therefore, we've lost our traditional knowledge and ways of living on the land and water to a great degree. Now, more than ever, we rely heavily on imported goods. One of the stable food in any Marshallese um, household that you can find are white rice, white flour, can or tin meats like tuna, corned beef, corned beef hash, Vienna sausage, along with ramen noodles, bar as frank hot dogs, imported frozen meats, vegetables, all of which are highly processed and filled with little to no nutrition. Local foods are substituted with all of these along with um, other sugary drinks and food. And this is to say that we are eating less and less of our local food. Um, it affects our overall health and well-being. And um, use my family as an example. Um, my dad's side of the family, him and his six siblings, uh, parents, aunts and uncles, and grandparents, most of them, all passed away due to diabetes and kidney failure. My dad passed away at the age of 52 years ago. And some, if not, most of my first cousins are either diagnosed or have higher cancer, higher chances of having prediabetes, diabetes, and borderline hypertension. On my mother's side, um, she has altogether 10 siblings, have hypertension and now diabetes and they all take medications for those too. So imagine eating on a daily, those kind of food and having to experience diabetes early on and losing your life to that. And I personally predict that um, our health in the Marshall Islands um, will only worsen from here on, especially with the impacts of rising sea level as referenced by Rosenet earlier. Um, next slide, please. Now, what scares me is that our health services are very limited here in the Marshall Islands. Just to give you an overview of our health facilities, we have two main hospitals located in our two urban areas, Mijoro and Ibai. We have about 59, roughly, give and take, uh, care centers servicing outer islands, and these are led by healthcare assistants, not doctors, healthcare assistants. There's, a one seven, there's one 177 health clinic, healthcare center here in Medro that I know, and it provides health service to 
people of four ads all only. The people of Enewata, Pigini, Kalian Uter. Um, this clinic is part of an agreement in our compact of free association with the U.S., uh, where the U.S. provides some funding for basic health care. Basic health care. Our facilities only provide basic health care, or we can say that they also provide primary, secondary, and some tertiary health care. The challenge here is that these facilities are not equipped with the necessary medical tools, medicines, and technical and human capacity to properly provide care for our cancer patients, and even for our overrising cases of NCDs and other medical issues. So for instance, um, our lab tests are being sent to labs in the state, Hawaii in particular, for pathologists to study and send back our lab results. Uh, for our patients that require further medical care, the RMI has supplemental insurance that can send our Marshallese patients to Hawaii, Philippines, um, or Taiwan for further treatments. But that doesn't guarantee all patients have eligibility to receive treatment, especially if your health case has less chance of making it um, out alive. Um, in other cases, Marshallese migrate to the U.S. to seek uh, medical assistance with families abroad, living abroad. Next slide, please. Oh, I that's just to give you like a visual of what our Madura Hospital look like. Those are the two main hospital. That one is Madura Hospital over there on the top left, and then that's Ebi Hospital, bottom. Next slide, please. <laughs> now, each year when we commemorate nuclear victims and survivors remembrance day in the Marshall Islands, we always have a theme. And this year's theme is Gurtabala, which can be literally translated as point of no return. However, it has a deeper cultural meaning that sums up how we perceive our nuclear legacy and is a reminder of the much needed work that requires all of us to do in order to bring nuclear justice to our people and our environment. Um, Kurtabalak is three words put together to make the word, the word Kurtabalak. When I was reflecting on this theme when it came out, this is how I make sense of it. Kur means to call out. Tup means wood shavings from carving of canoes. And luck means, you know, it, it implies looking ahead. So each wood shaving represents people. And as one of my elders shared with me, can also symbolize the creative ideas and solutions that we can use to move toward a peaceful future without nuclear weapons. And the idea of point of no return is meant to be there because it implies that we already know what nuclear weapons can do to humanity. In our case in the Marshall Islands, we have lived through it and we have fought to stop it even before it began. And we continue to voice the issue of nuclear testings to this day. There is no point of stopping right now. We must continue ahead until we receive the justice that we deserve. Next slide, please. Why is all of this important to me? The simple answer I can give is that the Marshall Island is home to many of us here. It is our place of belonging and we feel the most alive here. We are a proud matrilineal society, which means that our lands are passed on through our mother's lineages. Like our mothers, our lands provide everything that we need, the same with the ocean. And our livelihood is always dependent on the resources of both land and water. I want to say, uh, I want to say, end by saying, Kurtabalak, and carry on with the work that we are doing to end all nuclear weapons. For you, for me, for Railsnet's family, and for Ichiro, Bede, and Bede, whose spirit will continue to be with us as we continue our work toward a nuclear free world. Danity, thank you for bringing that spirit to us and sharing these stories. Arjun, you ready to go? Yeah, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Um, um, I'm going to give you a little survey of the tests 
and a little bit of the data around those tests. There were six tests in the Castle series. Bravo was the first. It's on March 1, but it's listed in the Department of Energy list is the February. Um, the total power of these tests was 46,000 kilotons. Uh, um, 40, yeah. Arjun, Which apologies is, oh, to interrupt you. Might, do you want to make your slide full screen? Oh, yeah. Thank you. About 46 times the total of all the atmospheric tests that were conducted. That's just this test series. Sing Bravo was the largest. No, oh, sorry, it's a little bit misplaced. These yields should... I'm sorry, I'll have to fix. I didn't notice that. I'm sorry. Um, Bravo, it should be all shifted up by one. I, I'll fix the slides and send them. I apologize, but the totals are correct. Um, and so there were some other very big tests, 11 megatons, 7 megatons nearly, and more than 13 megatons. This is one picture of the Bravo test, I think. Rosenet already showed something close to this. I want to show you some fallout maps that were made. Now, this is decay corrected. So this doesn't represent the actual fallout at the time of the test. It doesn't include like iodine-131, which causes all the thyroid problems, because this, this is corrected to what it remains 100 days after the test and almost no iodine 131 remains 100 days after the test. I'm gonna blow it up a little. So this is from the Bravo test alone. So here, the inner circle you see, this is in um, disintegrations per minute per square foot of land. Now, of course, all of these are hundreds of square miles and so you've got millions of square feet, but is the inner circle number is the fallout around the Marshall Islands. You see that as 50,000. And I will go here. This is Mexico City around here, 8150. So they had fallout measuring stations throughout the world. And these are data from those stations compiled in 19... 55 in a report um, uh, by, uh, I think it was the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I'm not sure the reference is, is there for you. Um, this is the cumulative fallout from the whole test series. I'm going to show you a different version of this. I'll show you the same thing. If you look at around the Marshall Islands, so the total fallout decay corrected to about 130 days after the test was about five times the total. So Bravo had the worst impact in terms of the fallout on people. Rongelap especially is very well known for that. But the total fallout was much greater. And in the whole of the Marshall Islands, was, uh, the long-term fallout was about five times from the Bravo test alone. And I'll show you a different version of this, but I want, this is Mexico City here. The cumulative fallout in Mexico City, 52,973 from the whole test series was about the same, let me go back and remind you, as, no, oh, sorry as this 50,000 in the marsh, around the Marshall Islands from the Bravo test alone. And this is as far as Mexico City on this side. And I'll show you another city on, in another map. We, com we made a map of this, an interactive map of this, and I want to go to the interactive map so I can show you the names of the cities. Can you see this? So this is, can you see this Mexico City? 
No, it's just showing us the PowerPoint slide still. You might have to stop sharing and start again. Uh, I, might, I can I, see it. I'll you stop, can see the I'll, 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 I'll stop sharing and then start sharing again. I do want, bear with me. Can you see this now? Oh, yeah. Mexico City. So this, this map was put together by a colleague of mine, Yunus Tinkabwala, from the maps from the 1955 report. And we tried to make it color, put the names of the cities. It's not complete yet. This is a work in progress, but it shows. So the Marshall Islands is here. So you can see a vast area of the ocean around the Marshall Islands was contaminated. You heard that the US only recognizes four atolls, but you can see there was intense fallout in a huge area of the ocean all around the Marshall Islands. There were hot spots in Mexico City on this side. There was another hot spot all the way westward to Colombo, Sri Lanka. There were um, I, there were was a fair amount of I think Fiji is somewhere around here, and um, so you can see there was there was not a non negligible amount of fallout in Albuquerque in Tucson, Arizona. So the Castle Test Series produced a vast global fallout. This map has never been analyzed for health impact, but I want to tell you that the US has had this map since 1955 and has yet still not admitted that the entire Marshall Islands was which I think is um, Now I'll continue with my slides. You've seen that. So this is the fallout from the Bravo test. These are RADs, cumulative fallout, 3,000. These are lethal levels of radiation, 3,000. 1900, 1300, 400 rads without medical treatment will kill about half the people. Uh, this is Rongelap here. Uh, oh, sorry. The, but you can see that all of these atolls were affected. I will show you that. So, I want to say something about the location of the test site. They said it was remote. And, but this should not be accepted at face value. After the Trinity test in New Mexico on July 16th, Stafford Warren conducted a radiological survey and found severe fallout in many places, including days after the test. And he advised that was a 25 kiloton test. We're talking about the castle series at 46,000 kilotons. And he said, if you, and a single test, of course, 15,000 kilotons. And he said, if you're going to do a similar test, that is about 25 kilotons, there should be no one within 150 miles of human, um, no human habitation within 150 miles. That was violated in Nevada, and that was violated in the Marshall Islands. And not only that, the people of Rangalap, as you know, were not evacuated for two and a half days, and, and they suffered very severe levels of radiation. The meteorological conditions and other conditions for testing were known in advance to not be suitable. So a quote from the official document before the first test was done at Bikini in 1946, is Marshall Island did not, quote, in the main, unquote, meet the criteria for a suitable site. And after the uh, 1948 test series, they said, which was at all, all the test three, I think, were um, at any we talk, they said it, the conditions were far from satisfactory. But of course, the test continued for another day, including the castle series. I want to give you some numbers and please focus on these numbers. So 1997, the National Cancer Institute published uh, a 
a large report with many maps, and I can show you the map, you know, when, during the question and answer, I don't want to talk for too long, I'm going to end very soon, about fallout from the Nevada test site testing, atmospheric testing. The most severe doses were to the thyroid because of iodine-131. It comes down in the rain, falls down the grass, cattle and sheep grazing, and when you drink the milk or eat the meat, especially drink the milk, not so much the meat, you get um, iodine-131, which has a half-life of eight days, which means it's gone in about three months. Um, the most severely contaminated places where people got the highest doses were generally in rural areas because people are drinking fresh milk. And they were four of the five most exposed counties with the highest average doses were in Idaho. So far as I know, I'm the only outside scientist who has gone to these counties to explain the results of the National Cancer Institute study. The National Academies did one meeting, but they did it in Boise, Idaho, the capital of Idaho, which is not in any of these counties. And there was one in Montana. I have not been to that. Um, so the average in these highest exposed was 120 to 160 milligram. Um, so the low exposure atolls, now this is according to the National Cancer Institute. So this is an official study from 2004. The low exposure southern atolls, not the lowest exposure, what they call, but the low exposure southern atolls, 270 milligrams. So roughly double the highest exposures in the United States to the thyroid age weighted in the Marshall Islands. Higher exposure northern atolls, higher exposure, my term, but obvious from about 10 times that of the low exposure. And so we're talking about 20 times the highest exposure in the United States to the thyroids. And these are average over areas. Uteric about 100 times, and Rondelap about 600 times. And these are official dose estimates. Uh, my friend Ben Frankie and many others, several others, uh, my friend Hans Bailing have done independent dose estimates their dose estimates to the thyroids are many times higher than this. So we're talking about independent dose estimates that are thousands of times higher than the highest dose estimates in the United States, thousands of times in the case of Rongelap and hundreds of times in the case of Uteric and dozens of times in the case of the other eight. Anyone looking at this, so other radionuclides of iodine goes along with all the other radionuclides, it goes away faster, they persist. This means the, this is absolute proof from the National Cancer Institute, along with the maps that I have shown you. This was my primary purpose today, is to absolutely demonstrate to you that by US government data from 1955 till today, well, it was 54 data compiled in 1955 and published in 1955. Till today, there, there should have been no doubt that the entire Marshall Islands was impacted and not only the entire Marshall Islands, but a very significant part of the globe with hot spots as far east as Mexico City and as far west, now we're talking east and west of the Marshall Islands, of course. I want to end by saying a couple of more general things. The, the Bravo test, of course, contaminated the lucky dragon, the number five, the fishing boat, and that became a very big scandal. It also did arouse global calls for ending testing. And I think it had a major role in the test moratorium from 58 to 61 or two, 61, I think. And um, it also raised calls for nuclear disarmament. We don't have that yet. And you know, that's what a lot of this fight is about. And I wanted to say a couple of things about health. Uh, thyroid doses, of course, but thyroid affects everything. Just a simple Google, I'm not a doctor. Tillman is on and maybe he will 
say something about the role of the thyroid, but it, it impacts everything. It impacts whether you put on weight, it impacts whether you lose weight, you know, whether you have too much or too little of the thyroid hormone, it impacts how you grow, it impacts your nervous system, it, it impacts everything. Uh, it impacts the parathyroid, impacts how much calcium you have in your blood. And that's just the thyroid. And I want, you know, you've talked about um, the grandmothers. And one, I want to end on this note, and I hope we'll publish a report soon on intergenerational, multi-generational impacts. But one of the things that has been most um, ignored or neglected in radiation research has been what we inherit from our mothers and maybe the Marshall Islanders being a matrilineal society will put this issue on the map as well. You have, I am sure, multi-generational impacts based on the doses and the research that is very clear from the data from Hiroshima and Nagasaki onward. But um, the a part of our DNA that we don't talk about a whole lot, the mitochondria, which is the energy system of our body, um, is inherited only from our mothers. There's mitochondria and the sperm, but it's stripped out <laughs> at the time of fertilization. So the mitochondria we have all come from our mothers. And there are hundreds of mitochondria or thousands in each cell, and they're much more easily damaged by radiation. And of course, it's our maternal inher inheritance from the ova that are made. And so, so let me, we have some young people here uh, I'm so happy to be on with you, Rodnet and Danity. I sometimes ask people, I won't ask you uh, when I talk how old they are, and they tell me their age, 25, 30, 35, whatever. And I tell them that that's only partly correct, that part of us is as old as our mothers, because the egg from which we were made was made in our mothers when they were in their mother's womb. So that idea, I hope that you as a women from a matrilineal society will make the world conscious of it. And I hope we can make progress in nuclear justice and getting rid of nuclear weapons uh, because they've been around for too long, uh, far too long. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arjun, Danity, and Rosnet. This has been a really incredible hour. We have a few minutes left. I don't see any questions in the chat, but if you want to pop some in there, um, just to be sure and tell you this webinar will be recorded and posted on the ICANN Australian YouTube channel. So it'll be available. I know that some of the young people and um, student groups and others will be utilizing this in the Marshall Islands over the next month as as they really commemorate this um, date. I learned so much. Um, so are there any questions? I think there's a hand raising function or pop them in the chat. Uh, be sure to visit Arjun's website. There's a lot of resources there in his books. Um, and again, this is a first of a series from the Nuclear Truth Project to that we will be continuing on with these uh, webinars and continuing to educate ourselves and lift up these voices that we just don't hear these stories. Um, it's a lot. And um, thank you, Rosnet and Danity, especially for your personal stories, for your personal photos and, and sharing your families and your lives with us. Sorry, I always get so emotional, but that's okay. That's what we're here for is to feel each other and to inspire each other to keep working and to keep carrying on. Um, we will send out a link. I think we'll have all your email addresses to send a link to the ICANN Australia YouTube channel. Um, I don't see anything really specific. We have Arjun's website in the chat. Lots of thanks all around and just, oh, what, oh thank you so much to all of you speakers. And please help me, join me in a big thanks to Jess Bolin and Jim Rummel from ICANN Australia, our invaluable partners. Um, providing the technical assistance for this webinar. And we send deep gratitude to our friends at MISA for the Pacific, 
the Pacific Conference of Churches and I Can Australia for joining us in co-sponsoring co this event. The funding is coming through a grant provided by the Equity Rises portfolio of the Plowshares, Plowshares Fund. This content is not necessarily endorsed by the agency. Um, you can visit our website at nucleartruthproject.com for more information, resources, and most importantly, there are protocols for engaging affected communities and peoples. Um, these protocols are in community consultations right now, but look for an upcoming webinar as we detail this really impor important work out in um, how we do our work together and how we respect each other and our stories. Okay, I'm losing it. Somebody want to take, off. I see a hand up. Jan, um, we're really at time, but we do have one minute, so go for it. Uh, I wanted to ask if Arjun could please comment on the connection between nuclear power, uh, that is the nuclear power uh, uh, reactors and uh, nuclear weapons, the nuclear power reactors that are created to, for electricity and other purposes. Well, it's a, it's a complicated it's a complicated question. Um, I'll try to give you a one minute answer, which is uh, the basics. The basics of the technologies are, are the same. Uh, the bombs depend on fission. Nuclear power depends on fission. You're splitting uranium atoms and or plutonium atoms uh, nuclei, and you get highly radioactive fission products. We still don't know what to do with the plutonium from all the surplus bombs and from all the. the waste from the nuclear power plants. There are some differences <coughs> in that, you know, the fission in the bombs happens all at once. And <coughs> the fission powers has to be controlled to produce electricity. <coughs> and, and but they all generate waste. The most ubiquitous pollutant they both generate is tritium, which is radioactive hydrogen. It becomes water. It has polluted everything is the most common pollutant from nuclear power plants. Um, it, it is discharged into rivers and lakes and the oceans and winds up in many people's drinking water supplies. Uh, that has also happened with nuclear weapons. In Savannah Riverside, they have tritium in the ponds there uh, from tritium production and plutonium production. And it evaporates the water from the ponds and it rains down radioactive rain on the other side of the river and many people's wells are contaminated. That also happens That also happens near nuclear power plants where tritium leaks and then it contaminates people's wells. Um, so there are many different connections. The, the political connection is this, uh, that uh, nuclear weapons were... So I think nuclear weapons became and illegitimate as an enterprise in December 1944, when the Manhattan Project found out that the Germans don't have a viable bomb project. And so from that time on, I think the justification for the project was over. I mean, the famous physicist Richard Feynman has, has said this also. Um, he was there in, in Los Alamos and, and in different words. And, and Nuclear power also similarly was born out of a sort of a self-deception. Eisenhower didn't want to talk about the horror of thermonuclear weapons alone in 1953 after the, after the Soviet thermonuclear test in September 53. And he told his speechwriters that, you know, I don't want a gloom and doom speech alone. Give me something good to say. Those are my words. Uh, but that was the message they got. And so the message they gave him was Atoms for Peace. Atoms for Peace is a fig leaf on the horror of thermonuclear weapons. That was how Atoms for Peace speech was constructed. And at that time, it was known that nuclear power would be much more expensive than coal-fired power even though the chairman of the AEC said it would one day be too cheap to meter. Every single official study done said it would be more expensive. Every single one that I've ever seen, and I've made an effort to find them all. So there's a kind of continuity to the layers of deception, cover up, withholding the truth, just like saying only four atolls were really affected when the data from 
1954 onward till today is very, very, very clear, at least in my opinion. Um, I'd be happy to debate this. And so the biggest problem with these two things, in my opinion, are not technical. The, the most anti-democratic instruments either for energy or military purposes invented by human beings. That's, that's what unites them both, most powerfully. That sounds like a big question for another webinar and all these yeah. things are Sorry, tied I took four minutes. No, that's okay. I took okay. four minutes, sorry. You in four <laughs> minutes is pretty darn good, Arjun. <laughs> and always explains to me things in a capsule, so. Um, Thanks for your questions. Um, we do have the link to the YouTube channel in chat. Again, thank you technology, uh, all your support here. So we just wanna thank everyone for joining us. Um, we'll put you on our mailing list and we'll be sending out, um, we'll be doing more of these webinars and, and getting us together and carrying on, so. Pam, could I say how happy I have been to share this platform with Danity and Rosie? Thank you for doing that, making it possible for this old guy to be to be on, hey, on the platform with it. Yeah, I really am very honored and appreciate. Likewise, so very honored to share my story with you all today. Thank you. Betty has just asked if.